co-founder of a company called the Office for Creative Research. And I'm going to talk about a little, bit, a little of the work that we've been doing with Acumen, but I want to start with a conversation around data, because our work is foundationally about data. And I think there are some really important pieces uh, of thinking that, that, that really underlie the work that we've been doing. Now, we know that, that, that there's data everywhere. I, an hour ago, I, I went on to my computer and I asked the New York Times API, how many articles have been published up to now in 2014 that have mentioned the word data? 17,717. This conversation about data is ubiquitous. But one of the things that we're most interested in is what is the human experience of data? I have a metaphor that I use uh, to talk about this, and it, it might be biased because I spend a lot of time in airports, but there's something interesting about the airport experience, right? When, uh, there are two things that I'm most interested in. The first thing is that when I cross that TSA line, I am no longer in control of my life. Right? <laughs> I'm told where I go, uh, I'm touched inappropriately, and, and really, until I get past the other line on the other side, uh, I've kind of lost agency. And then the second thing, which is maybe more important, is that while you're in the airport and on the airplane, you're part of a system which is almost inconceivably immense. A at any given time, there are more than a million people in the air. And what you're seeing in this visualization is this respiring system as planes are landing and taking off and landing and taking off in every airport in the world. And I don't think this is unlike the experience that people have with data. Right? They're immersed in a system which is so complicated they can't understand it. But they also feel like they don't have any control. And data, though, is a simple thing. We, we can use a very simple definition for it. Data are measurements of something. And, and what I'm most interested in is when that something is us, when, when data is produced by measuring humans. Now, this isn't a new thing. Um, in the um, early 20th century, uh, a, a sociologist named Jacob Moreno did a series of studies where he tried to map social relationships. And the image you're seeing on the screen is the social relationships between students in a seventh grade classroom. Boys on the left, girls on the right. Two early pubescent people crossing that gulf. And, and, and this is kind of what we're doing still, but we're doing this at scale and we're doing it differently. Right? So when we are trying to connect data with humans or trying to make data from humans, we're, we're doing it with computers and we're doing it from afar. So this gulf between data and humans has become larger and, and I think somewhat problematic. Um, I had a chance in 2009 to work on a project with this man, Lashlo Berbashi, who is uh, uh, one of the world's leading experts in network science. And he had stumbled upon a really amazing data set. And the data set was from one of the largest telecom companies in the world, in Europe. And it was their entire cell phone records for a month, um, anonymized. And, and then inside this records, these records were a group of 10,000 people who had agreed to have their location as well, their location data shared. And so I built this little tool that allowed me to look at every individual in this system. Here's one individual in this system. And this person, over a course of four days, is traveling back and forth and back and forth, um, just within a 2.1 kilometer region. So this individual is a dedicated European commuter. Right? They're going back and forth to work. And what was amazing about this was that I could look at this pattern for everybody in the data set. I remember one individual where I could see quite clearly that their pattern was like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They were somewhere else. Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. It was Friday. It was at 5.30. I knew they were going to the pub, right? And not only that, because I had the latitude and longitude point, I could reverse engineer it. I would know which pub they went to. So it sort of raised this idea that I thought was so amazing was that I could go to that pub on a Friday and sidle up to the bar and be like, I know everything about you just from the data that you're leaving behind on your cell phone, which in 2009 was kind of crazy, right? Now we would, we would just be like, okay, Mr. NSA employee, we know that <laughs> already. But this type of work, it sent me down a, a path that I've been following um, in, in one way or another since then. Because we can measure people now without even intending to measure them, which I think is very interesting. And so I, I was in Las Vegas last week. You can send condolences later. And, and um, 
I, I, I collected a couple of tweets while I was there. These are people who have just turned on their phones when they've landed at the airport because they want to share the fact that they're in Las Vegas with their friends. And, and so this is not high literature, although it's quite interesting. There's little human stories in here. But also what's in here is, is a sh shared piece of information, a measurement. They've told me where they're going. And because I know where they live, because they share that information in their profile, I can stitch that together into a system where we can see everybody on Twitter, just from when they're saying, J I just landed in or I just arrived in, where they're coming and going. And this was in 2009 with very few people on Twitter. And, and there's something very interesting happening here, right? So we're, sta we're standing at a very far distance, but we're able to put together uh, um, this, this, this information about these really vast systems. And, and so this is a, a similar project with a little bit more light-hearted tone, which is called Good Morning. This is everybody in the world on Twitter saying good morning in 2009. The green dots are people saying good morning early. The red ones are people saying good morning later on. Now, there's something I think here that is maybe against what we would normally think about when we think about data visualization. When I tell people I do data visualization, they're like expecting to see graphs and charts, but I don't normally do graphs and charts. And the reason for that is because I, I believe there are two purposes for data visualization. The first one is the one that we're most familiar with. Let's take a complicated thing and make it simpler. Maybe build a graphic so that the CEO can understand it or that, so the uh, market can understand it or whatever that case is. But the second thing is, I think, a little bit more interesting, which is can we see something we've never been able to see before? And so to help you understand that, I have a couple of um, uh, very simple examples. This is, this is Florence Nightingale's rose diagram showing deaths in the Crimean War. And so very simply, all of the um, blue areas are people who died of a parasitic borne disease. All of the other areas are people who died from normal wa war causes, like shooting and exploding and things like that. And so um, this is taking something very complicated and making it simple. Right on the other side of the coin, we have this graphic, which was by Dr. John Snow, where he plotted the incidences of a cholera outbreak in London. And by looking at how these incidences clustered, he was able to figure out that this cholera outbreak came from this infected well in this specific um, place in London. Right? So in one case, we're taking things that is complicating and making it simple. In the other one, we're seeing something new. Medical technology around the same time, we have two devices. One, this sphygmomanometer takes your blood pressure Right? This is a, takes the circulatory system and turns it into two numbers. And the, uh, by the other end of the coin, you have the x-ray, which was a transformative medical tool because it allowed us to see things that we'd never seen before. So I spent two and a half years at the New York Times as the data artist in residence, and I started investigating this idea of can we make tools that allow us to reveal things? Can we make tools that allow us to understand systems in ways that we'd never understood them before? And maybe the biggest tool that we made while I was there was this tool called Cascade, which allowed us to see how one piece of, uh, of content got shared from person to person over time. So this is what a cartoon of Cascade looks like. This is what the real thing looks like. So we can do this with any story that the Times publishes. They publish about 3,000 stories a day. And we can, um, we can, we can see, um, or 3,000 stories every two weeks, and we can see how that conversation grows like a tree. And not only that, we can see the branching structure of that tree as this thing grows because this is an interactive tool. So we can put this view into 3D mode and be able to actually see the mechanisms of sharing. And this was very exciting for us because we could now ask new questions that we would never ask before, like, why do all of Nicholas Kristof's stories look like these low, sprawling shrubs, right? And why, why do political stories look like Christmas trees? All right, why are some of these trees lopsided and why, why do some of them have two pieces? And by being able to add to our vocabulary, we were able to understand things better. And I have a word that I use to describe this whole um, process, which is called question farming. How, how, can, we, how can we get closer um, to, to these insights that are hidden within data? Right, but this gulf between data and humans that I was talking about before exists in all these projects. We're, we're actually using this data without people knowing that we're, that we're using their data. There's something strange going on there. And it's strange and it's impacting our lives every day. Um, does anybody have a flashlight app? Have you ever, you ever installed a flashlight app on your phone? Well, if you have, it probably asks for your location data. Well, why was it asking for your location data? Well, because it's selling that information to advertisers. And advertisers are using that to try to build a profile of you. They're trying to measure you so they can sell you good internet ads. Now here's 2,500 of my own internet ads. 
um, from two weeks in August. And I sent this to 10 strangers and I paid them $5 to write a story about me. As I was interested in what would happen, what, what, what do people think they know about me <laughs> from the measurements that they're collecting. And this is about this distance. Right? It's about <laughs> this distance that exists between the real me and the data about me. And, and one of the fallacies that is behind all of our data thinking <laughs> is, that, is that these things that exist in our databases, that exist in our spreadsheets, are the real things. But they're not the real things, right? They're these other things. So we have a tool called Floodwatch, by the way, which you can install in your browser and it'll track your advertising history so that you can get an idea of what advertisers think they know about you. Um, which is actually, I think, fairly interesting. Um, and, and, and with, I was so excited to have the chance. I met Jacqueline on a bus, and, and a few days later, I was talking to Tom, uh, who you'll meet in a second, about how we can apply some of these things. How can we get closer to this connection between data and humans? Because I think the work that is happening at Acumen is deeply human. And, and, and so we've been working on a couple of projects together. And um, one of my favorite ones, which we've just been able to show, is this project with Zakitsa, which is the ambulance service you heard about a second ago. So these are 361 av ambulances in Odisha um, who are all bustling around trying to solve this problem that we heard about. So this is a very interesting and a very different way of seeing this problem that you'd seen before. And we can do things with this data. We can split it up by districts so that we can see which districts are being served more, which districts are being served less. We can then take those... Um, take those clusters of ambulances and figure out what are they doing, right? What are the actual things that are happening within those regions? And, and I think um, Sasha mentioned this, that one of the most important reasons that these ambulances are, or what the important things that these ambulances are doing are dealing with mothers who are having compl uh, complications in pregnancy. And for me, this project is like a keystone of my thinking. Right, because it's easy to look at graphics, it's easy to look at data visualizations and to see some orange lines and some white dots. But what it's hard to understand and what we really need to understand is that those white dots are people. And they're people who are being taken to a hospital with moments of joy and also moments of terror and moments of, of, of fear. And, 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 and all of these things are encoded in this data. And I hope that as we continue along with our work with Acumen, we'll be able to find more and more ways to understand the possibilities that underlie this data. And if there's one message that I would love for all of you to take away, it's the fact that data is deeply human. And our thinking around data, as, um, as it's happened in the last five years, has been very non-human. This term big data really speaks nothing about the people that are underlying these systems. Sometimes I hear people use this phrase, which drives me crazy. Data is the new oil. Data is not something that we suck out of the ground. It's something we produce. And very often, it's the, these pieces and these numbers that are tethered to our lives. And so what I hope is that we can head towards this sort of era of data humanism. And, and I really believe that this work that we're doing with Acumen is a step in that direction. And so without any further ado, I'm going to um, introduce the, the second. We're, we, we started a hip hop group, right? Data and Impact. I'm Data. This is Impact. Um, yeah. Tom Adams. So, so now we're rapping from now on. Um, thank you so much, Joe. It's been such a pleasure and such a privilege working with you over the last year. And um, I just wanted to come on and we'll look at the, the other piece of data art. There's another incredible tool that Joe and his terrific team have put together for another one of our um, investees, Sproxel. And um, we're going to try and manipulate this tool, tool live. So yeah, it's you can a little scale it's, scale the yeah. whole down, so I'll zoom yeah. out a little bit. Yeah. So what I'd like to do to start with with this tool, I mean, Joe talked about the sort of hidden stories we can kind of pull out. And I think we can kind of show you some of those stories we're trying to pull out from this tool. So we can, what I'd like to start to do is to look at this, this map in the topography mode, which shows all the different texts that are coming in and across Nigeria as a result of Sproxel. And we can kind of flip it into a 3D version of, of it and start to look at exactly the sort of map of the penetration of Sproxel across, 
across Nigeria. And this is, this is so exciting to me to see it come alive like this because we can start to see Sproxel has got these great mountains of text that it started to produce in the southeast around Lagos, sorry, southwest in Lagos and into the southeast, the Niger Delta region. And then it sort of goes up into the north and you kind of flip into these sort of hilltops, these sort of undulating hills where maybe the company hasn't penetrated as much, uh, even though the, the population is, is just as populous up in the north. And then there are these areas in the, in the west, in Kwara State, um, Nigeria is someone I lived with for three years, so I, so I know it well. And, and in the East Taraba state, where the company hasn't yet to, to get into this area. So we start to really see, just, just by looking at how it's undulating, how, how this company is affecting and penetrating Nigeria. And we can also use this, this tool to look at some fairly quirky things in the data um, and, and find new stories. And there's, uh, is the time bar coming up along the top? Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's hidden by the, the it right didn't the scale our screen down. Anyway, um, we can't quite see it here, but one of the things we've been able to use this tool for is to look at how texts are coming through the day and see, and we actually unsurprisingly see that. I, I got you covered. Okay, it's, uh, it's the beginning of the day. Yeah. Now we're at 5 a.m. Yeah. And this is coming up on noon right now. And about 5 p.m. And then this big spike. Yeah, in the evenings, which is so, so interesting for us to start to find out that People are scratching off their, their um, text messages in the evening, sending text to Sproxel around that, and that's, that seems to be when the N Nigerians are taking their, taking their medicines before evening, and it's, it's a really interesting insight that the company can start to use. Um, but this tool uh, comes into its own, I think, when we flip the mode from these hills into this detail version of, of the tool. And here, here we get to see all of the text as individual text through a day, through a year, and we can start to look at these texts. You can see the first thing that jumps out is that some of them are blue and some of them are red. And every red text which is jumping up, which is about 30% of them, is a, a text which shows that someone has been told that this is a, uh, a, not a, um, it's potentially a counterfeit drug, it's not an official drug. And so every single one of those dots that pops up is an example of someone who's sent a text to Sproxel and has received a message back saying, don't take that drug. It's a potentially either harmful or, or substandard drug. And I just think it's, amazing to see. Again, Joe was talking about the human stories. You can just sit and look at this for ages and see all of those times it pops up. Yeah, the numbers here, I think, are really incredible, too. You can see this bar that's spiking as we get to that peak time, in which you have almost 500 of these SMSs being sent per hour. And, and Joe's, Joe's team has done some other fantastic things, which is to start, again, we're talking about patterns and look at. We can lay over this map some certain other interesting uh, interesting maps, the population density. Nigeria is a heavily populous country. And we can start to look at the uh, poverty rates and where, where there's greatest poverty. And, and perhaps one of the most interesting is this, this map of the malarial burden. And we can start to compare the performance of Sproxel against where there is the most malarial burden across Nigeria um, and uh, look to see how their malarial drugs are performing against that. We find some interesting things about some of the places in Nugu and Anambra where, where there's lots of malaria, but perhaps Sproxel hasn't quite got into those markets yet. So I am, I am blown away, and we're, we're actually, I think, just beginning to scratch the surface of how we can use these, these really interesting tools to look, look at, um, at both these hidden stories and these new patterns. Um, but in many ways, most interesting of all, as Joe was describing, some of the, the human stories. And one of the really, really lovely things about Sproxel is that when people send a text to the company, they often also send um, a message with it. And so whilst people are, at, are checking their drugs, they're also sending these incredible messages, which really, really uh, hammers home just how, what an impact Sproxel is making. So I, so I hope you can see that these tools, I mean, it's been such a privilege working with you, Joe, and I hope that you can see that these tools are just scratching the surface of what is possible. Uh, we do a lot of work with trying to work out what the data of impact is, but this, these tools allow us to feel and experience the, the impact that we're having and how we use data to bring that home to you all. Um, so uh, this, is, this is the beginning, and we're going to be working on more tools like this, I hope. It's exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and a hip-hop group as well. <laughs>